back again with uh, another protection. So we want to protect the lungs also. When we are ventilating, we don't want to give more trouble to the baby because he's already troubled. His lungs are not good for some reason, either because of RDS or because of pulmonary edema, whatever be the reason, we ventilated him. And at the same time, we want to ensure that we don't want to uh, give any trouble to the neonate, isn't it? Just one so second, like, Shiram. I think yeah. you need to keep it in the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Is it visible? Yes. Yeah, visible and audible. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, this is a very important preventable complication, ventilator-associated pneumonia. So my talk has got two parts, ventilator-associated pneumonia and also a, an overview of the infection control because of time constraints, I can't uh, uh, dwell into the details of infection control each and every aspect. So I'll be talking very briefly about infection control at the end. So let us begin. So I'll be covering these aspects of the ventilator-associated pneumonia, the definition, the pathogenesis, the prevention and surveillance, and a word about infection control. Now, I should, I'm beginning with a controversy here because the definition in uh, about ventilator-associated pneumonia is controversial. It is not very well established. If you look at even in the adults also, the CDC definition, it's changing. It's changing again and again. So several new terms have been implemented, even in the pediatric age group. But till now, for neonates, we don't have a standard, uh, well-accepted definition across the globe. So we are still in the dark and uh, searching for better answers about how to define what is meant by VAP. Clinically, the VAP may be evident, but if you want to compare the VAP across different units, how well each unit is doing in prevention of VAP, then the problem arises because we want a standard definition for that in order to compare different uh, units. But if you want to look at your own data, then it is okay. Yeah, so if you look at the old definition of CDC, which, which encompass, it broadly says for less than one year, we don't have an unit specific, that definition is like this. So mind you, this VAP definition is basically for invasive ventilation only. So we don't have uh, a separate definition for a non-invasive ventilation. So whether that increases the risk of uh, VAP is not at clear. So what we are going to, what I'm going to deal with here is only about invasive ventilation and the pneumonia, which occurs consequent to invasive ventilation. So the basic definition is a baby has to be ventilated for at least 48 hours. And subsequently, if a baby develops a new infiltrate on the chest X-ray or the infiltrates which are not improving, for example, if you ventilate the baby for RDS because he failed your non-invasive modality of ventilation. So we expect some improvement by 48 hours. So if these things are not clearing, or a, a new infiltrate is seen on the chest X-ray, or if you have done a blood gas, a blood gas is showing hypoxia or hypercarpia, things are not going uh, as per your, uh, I mean, as, per, as what you think. Apart from that, there should be also, so these things should be there. So the, the baseline is duration of mechanical ventilation for at least 48 hours. Either you have a new change on the chest X-ray or there is a normal gas exchange along with these things like three of the following temperature instability. We don't know the cause of it. We think it is because of the infection in the lungs. If there is a purulent sputum, which is unusual in a neonate, but this is, this is for babies who are less than one year. So this definition is there in that. Increase in respiratory secretions. That means it is again not very much quantified. So it is left to the clinician to decide whether secretions have increased or the need for suctioning, AT suctioning has increased. Or if you have done a uh, workup for the worsening status and you, are, you have a leukopenia or there is leukocytosis. Mind you, more than 15,000 may not be a great idea in a newborn, but as I said earlier, this is for less than one year from CDC. Or he has a new onset distress. The baby has been stable on mechanical ventilation for 48 hours and now he throws up an, a new onset apnea or he becomes more tachypneic or there are signs of respiratory distress in the form of flaring, retraction, or he develops uh, ronchi, or there are changes in the heart rate that is either going to brady or tachycardia. So three of these things. So this is a, a an over definition, but as you can see, there are several limitations in this in applying, in applying directly. But uh, 
So this is a problem here, but this was being used as a uh, definition for defining the VAP till almost 2013 or so. Now CDC also utilizes this microbiological criteria to say, uh, for, to saying that whether the VAP is because of common bacterial fungal. So how do we prove that the, the infection so whatever change in the X-ray you are seeing, is it because of infection? But if you want to say it properly, because uh, getting a culture from the lung is again very difficult. Uh, but in addition to the radiographic criteria and clinical, we should have one of these. That means either a positive growth in blood culture, and, uh, and we think that the culture is not unrelated to any other organ infection, like a urinary tract infection or a CNS infection. And we presume that the blood culture is positive secondary to the infection in the uh, lung itself. Or if there is an effusion, a culture of that. If you don't have any of these, then if you have uh, increased secretions and you have done a bronchoalveolar lavage or a protected ET aspirate, that you should, but that, that has to be quantitative in nature. So it is not a qualitative, just if the uh, microbiology report says that it is only gram stain is positive or negative, and it says that some organism has been isolated that doesn't have any meaning, just like urinary culture, you should have at least more than 10 power five colony count. So when you're interpreting a bowel specimen, or an ET culture, you should always look at whether they are given the colony counts. If not, please ask the microbiologist to provide the colony counts. Again, it is almost like UTI. It has to be at least more than 10 power 5 because colonization versus infection is again a challenge to differentiate in case of uh, this uh, aspirates, basing on these aspirates. Uh, otherwise, uh, the other histopathological examination, again, it's very difficult. We don't usually do biopsy specimens or uh, culture of the lung parenchyma, that is biopsy, or you have uh, evidence of infection by fungal uh, hyphae or a pseudo hyphae. So these are the various criteria which have been, because these are largely usually not done in neonates or is difficult to be done in the neonates. So, but we don't have any other definition. So because of this lot of uh, problems with these, uh, because as I said earlier, X-ray, we have multiple etiologies which can mimic. It's very difficult to say this kind of a pattern is classically pneumonia because for us, MAS is a classical thing. MAS has pneumonitis, the chemical pneumonitis to differentiate that from a infectious pneumonitis is a challenge. Uh, the in, if you look at this definition, the increase in ventilator parameters is not very well defined. There are so many confounders which could uh, cause such a similar scenarios. So, and there are a lot of subjective uh, findings here. They are very variable. They are not very defined. For example, if you look at the increased secretions, it is not very clear what is really meant by increased secretions, isn't it? So this precludes comparison between the units. So we cannot uh, compare the exactly whether one doing one unit has a more map when compared to the other units. So the uh, so this definitions have changed from the VAP to what is called as VAE ventilator associated events. So this is the new definition which has started, the CDC has started putting out these definitions almost from uh, a decade back in the adults and gradually now it is getting percolated into the pediatric area. And now into the neonatal field also, these definitions are now being used. There are problems with these also, I'll come to that in a minute. So now they don't classify it as uh, VAP alone. So it is called as ventilator associated events. So they were, uh, the several events are described in an umbrella term, like pneumonia, pulmonary edema, collapse, air leaks, whatever it is. So a baby who is ventilated, if he has a, a adverse event on a ventilation, that is what is now the CDC is trying to pick it up. So basically these definitions have been employed to look at these uh, to for surveillance purposes. It is not basically to clinically uh, to diagnose a case of VAP or something. It is basically for surveillance across the units. So for that reason, these definitions have been uh, used. Now, briefly, if you look at the ventilator associated event definition is, uh, even in neonate also, the almost same definition has been employed by the CDC. So again, the num duration of ventilation remains the same. So for a baby to have a, uh, to, to say the baby had an adverse event on ventilation, it is defined as duration of ventilation for at least 48 hours, that is two calendar days. 
Along with that, now the ventilator parameters have been implicated. That means I've been used to define this ventilator associated event. That is increase in FiO2 of 25% from the baseline, baseline minimum in the preceding two days. That is, if a baby was on say 30% was a minimum FiO2 which he has been in the previous 48 hours and now it has become an increase by 25% from that, then uh, it is considered as an increase. The second thing is not only FiO2, uh, if there is a change in the MAP of almost four centimeters from the baseline minimum in the previous two days, suppose if he's on say a map of eight, now the map increased to 12 centimeters, that is four centimeter rise is considered as a uh, increase in the ventilator setting. So that constitutes a definition of VAE. So if a baby has, it's not both, either FIO to change or a map change, which has been there for at least one hour. So that change uh, persists for more than one hour is considered to be a, a fit to be taken as uh, a ventilator associated event. So this is a very objective way of defining. So it has been used in adults and pediatric, uh, but Mind you, this is not for diagnostic purposes, basically for surveillance purposes. So this is the definition here. Now, among this uh, thing, as you can see here, so this is what I said, ventilator associated event, a change in the FiO2 and MAP. So so a change in the So if you have a change and we call it as pediatric ventilator associated condition. If this uh, PED ventilator associated condition is associated with a change in the temperature or in the uh, change in the WBC counts, or if you, if you have added a new antimicrobial agents and has been used for at least four days, then it is considered as ventilator associated condition, infection associated ventilator associated condition. And if the same thing is microbiologically proven, then it becomes a uh, possible ventilator associated VAP. So this is the uh, definition which is now considered uh, useful in defining VAP. So this is basically for surveillance purpose. So you should have a ventilator associated event which is defined by the change in the FiO2 and MAP. Then you should have either, either you add an antibiotic and has been using for four days or you have a change in your leukocytosis or temperature instability along with a positive uh, microbiological culture. Then we take it as the pediatric VAP. So all these things are together called as ventilator associated events. So this is the definition as far as definition is concerned. I'm sorry why this is not changing, yeah. So again, this complex definition again has issues. Now, the, the utility is that it is not relying on X-rays. So the X-ray has been taken out. That is the main important things. And that the subjectivity uh, findings like your increased secretions or presence of ascul uh, ascultatory findings like reputations, V. So those things have been taken out from the uh, this uh, uh, definition. So that makes it more objective. But there are issues with this also. So what has happened is it is too specific and it is, seems to miss several uh, mild or moderate VAP episodes. This different because the change in MAP may not be so high. It could be less than whatever the definition and still the baby could be having a ventilator associated pneumonia. So several studies, even in the adults, as well as in the pediatric age group have found that this two, this uh, very objective definition seems to miss several VAP episodes. So still we are in the dark. So despite having so much of complex definitions, still we are, we don't have a clear cut answer as to what to be used as the uh, definition for a ventilator associated pneumonia precisely so that we can compare across different units. You can use the same kind of a definition for comparing in your own unit to look at VAP, what is the rate of VAP previously and if you do certain changes and now look it again as to the what is the incidence of VAP uh, at this point of time. You can compare within the unit but if for, for a national wide comparison or different unit comparison still we are in the dark as to uh, what is the exact definition. So that is why 
the wap cdc it is said that the cdc is now no more monitoring the wap episodes across different units it is only looking at the ventilator associated events uh, specifically but not wap yeah coming to the pathogenesis moving on so you have these the sources of infection can be endogenous spread or it could be exogenous so uh, exogenous so both can create the problem endogenous means so what is happening is uh, whenever a baby is uh, intubated so uh, if a baby is intubated what is happening is i'm sorry so we, when you have a, a endotracheal tube in c2 there is collection of secretions so there is an increase because this being a, a foreign body inside sitting inside the oral cavity as well as into the larynx into the respiratory tract so this stimulates a lot of secretions not only that there could be reflux of these secretions and it could pull along there is a colonization uh, which is happening in the oropharynx and there is the pool of secretions usually accumulates around the endotracheal tube so this is very important and it extends along the trachea so there is a colonized colonization happens along the entire the endotracheal tube so this is this seems to be the reason and slowly this get trickled into the uh, lungs and that creates the pneumonia so that that is how the pneumonia happens because of uh, these things so that is the principle behind which uh, the, the pathogenesis behind the ventricular associated pneumonia so basically the impaired clearance system because of your endotracheal presence of a foreign body this leads to increased colonization and this colonization the fluid which is filled with this colonization slowly aspirates into the lung so it is not a major aspiration it is basically a micro aspiration which uh, uh, triggers the infection seeping into the lungs and developing pneumonia the other possibility is that there could be a hematogenous also hematogenous spread is also known that is baby may be having uh, infection in some other site and now he develops infection in the lungs because of uh, from the blood so that is also possible the other route is exogenous source that is because of us so our improper uh, hand care so that is uh, another important thing if you don't take care of uh, hands i mean the asepsis is not taken care so that leads to infection or there could be the endotracheal tube i mean sorry the ventilator circuits if they are not maintained properly as we have explained in the supportive care writing last week so if that is not taken care properly that also leads to infection and the third possibility is the biofilm formation so whenever there is the endotracheal tube is there for a longer time there is a biofilm formation you must have seen a slimy layer is formed inside the endotracheal tube the baby is ventilated for a longer duration so this slimy layer consists of uh, is basically because of uh, the bacteria along with the mucus so that also is again a source of infection so all these things leads to trickling of these things again into the lungs creates pneumonia so these are the two major pathogenesis major sources of infection in wap now moving on yeah what are the risk factors for the ventilator associated pneumonia so if you look at the meta analysis there is a recent meta analysis published where they have shown that the, the highest risk factor is for reintubation so if a baby needs reintubation almost you are increasing the risk of developing wap to almost nine times it is so high but in this study that the ci is very wide it may be not, it is not very precise estimate but still it is showing a very high ci so this is again a preventable thing isn't it so if you if you if you can decide extubation properly and prevent reintubation you are again eliminating the risk of wap significantly so that is the most important thing another important thing is lack of enteral feeding so this is not enteral this is a lack of enteral feeding if you don't have enteral feeding it's almost you are increasing the risk of wap by almost five times that means if you if you don't feed so what is going to happen is you are increasing the colonization of the nico organisms or the pathogenic organisms into the gi tract the gi tract gets colonized with all kinds of your nico bugs and as i said earlier these uh, uh, gastric secretions there is always a reflux it may not be a clinically evident reflux so these secretions again slowly trickle around the endotracheal tube and then they get pulled up in the area of the laryngopharynx and from there again they trickle down so your microorganisms is getting transferred from the gut into the lungs 
So how can we prevent it? If you promote the usage of breast milk, so you have seen from Dr. Nalini's talk that it, it increases the, it helps in neuroprotection also. So here it is again protective to the lungs also. So if you have mother's own milk, so it promotes beneficial bacterium, growth of beneficial bacterium, and thus reduces the risk of ventilator associated pneumonia. And naturally, because of poor defenses, low birth weight weights, premature babies, these are also uh, at risk of uh, increased risk of ventilator associated pneumonia, apart from bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Not only that, the duration of ventilation also is very important. The longer the duration, the more the risk of ventilator associated pneumonia. This has not been evaluated in this meta-analysis, but this is again evident across several studies. Usually, if a baby is ventilated for more than 72 hours, the risk of uh, VAP increases significantly. Now, how do we diagnose VAP? So by the definition, which I have said, that can be used, but again, with the drawbacks. So we should have for definitive diagnosis because it's an infection, we, we rely on microbiology. So we should look at the blood culture. So the positivity rate of blood culture in a pneumonia is around, so we have done a recent study uh, in the multi-center study uh, for looking at the, the positive rates of blood culture among neonates with pneumonia, but not in a ventilated case, in a community acquired pneumonia and found out to be around 20%. So, but in a case of uh, ventilator associated pneumonia, which is basically because of several resistant organisms, you may get the culture rates can be much higher. So, don't think that we won't get anything for uh, pneumonia. We do get so because neonates do have a very high colony counts in the blood. So, always send a blood culture even if you think it is pneumonia. So, blood culture is mandatory. If uh, that is not yielding, then you can do a, if a prolonged ventilation is happening, then we have, we may have to resort to uh, BAL, that is bronchoalveolar lavage or AT secretions. But sampling them is very difficult. Uh, there are logistic difficulties involved because it could get contaminated as you take out the secretions from the endotracheal tube, it gets contaminated with the uh, colonized organisms in the oral cavity or in the nasopharynx or in the oropharynx. So that risk is always there. So that is why for that reason to differentiate a, a simple colonization versus infection, we should always request for the colony count. So if the colony count is more than 10 power 5, then only we can think that it is basically causing pneumonia. Otherwise, we take it as just colonization. The other thing is to look at pneumonia in, in sort of test x-rays because it is confusing. You can look at the lung ultrasound. So that is also, it's an emerging thing. If you are uh, practicing it, it becomes easier for you to pick it up. So in a recent study, a relatively small study published in uh, European Journal of Pediatrics. So they use the lung ultrasound as a primary modality to pick up the uh, incidence of uh, ventilator associated pneumonia. So presence of uh, consolidation more than 5.5 centimeters effusions or the linear dynamic uh, air bronchograms in the ultrasound. So they have given a score of two for each. So after the third day that is following uh, 48 hours of ventilation, if the score is 5, they have found the sensitivity to be 94% in picking up the VAP episodes. Uh, so apart from lung ultrasound, they also take in clinical things like temperature instability, change in airway secretions, deterioration on the uh, respiratory support, so and microbiology. So all these stuff they have put together, they have taken a scoring system uh, and they found sensitivity to be 94% in picking up the VAP episode if the score is more than 5. But mind you, this is a very small study. The numbers are smaller, need a larger data for a validation purpose. It's a, it's, a, it's a good topic for the young students to do a research on that, whether this kind of a scoring system is really valid in picking up the VAP episodes. Now coming to the important aspect of VAP, that is prevention. So the most important thing is the bundle approach. So that is, this has been the uh, thing across the worldwide, across the all the age groups, they found that this bundle approach is very useful in decreasing the incidence of VAP. This bundle approach consists, it starts most importantly with the, with the hospital personnel, that is hand hygiene. How do we handle the secretions? How do we position the infant? Humidification. So most of the things have been covered, like humidification. So these have been, we have covered in the supportive care, which Dr. Tejo has clearly showed you on a live demonstration from Fernandez. So, and extubation, reintubation. So avoiding the reintubation, as I said, enteral feeding and oral cholesterol. So I'll just tell you about a word about these things only. Now handling the secretions, how do we handle the secretions? So 
again coming back again to the reflux of gastric contents as one of the principal pathogenic source of infection so we should try to can we put the baby head up so that is one aspect again there is not much evidence on this but uh, the, nowadays it is recommended to uh, keep it slightly higher but again the smaller the baby it, it may create a problem because uh, if you want to use gravity to prevent the uh, uh, moving up of the gastric secretions into the endotracheal tube at the same time we don't want to decrease the brain blood flow also in a very in a micropremie so whether really we have to do head up across all gestations across all the babies is again debatable it is not the evidence is not clear on that for a baby who has been on a ventilator for a long time and uh, there are significant secretions probably uh, even those babies you may keep the baby slightly head up around 15 to 20 degrees up so that is may be done but it is again there is no recommendation if you look at the evidence see one other there are studies where they have looked at whether left lateral position because that is known to reduce the incidence of reflux whether it is useful a small study is there where they have shown that left lateral position ventilating the babies in left lateral position decreases the uh, risk of aspiration and uh, interestingly how did they know the reflexes happened any idea so they have used gastric pepsin as a marker in the secretion so they have looked at the uh, secretions around the endotracheal tube and found and looked at the levels of gastric pepsin so that is how it has been evaluated whether the gastric contents are uh, lurking around the around the endotracheal tube so that is how they have done the studies so another area where you can look at so an interesting topic to look into the uh, you can do a research on these topics now how do we handle the secretions so once uh, there are secretions so how do we suction them so this again has been demonstrated uh, in the uh, supportive care um, in the first weekend of the ventilation workshop we have done that so we should have a meticulous asepsis and uh, uh, we, we need two personnel so that is very important now there are two types of suctioning which can be done closed suction versus open suction so open suction is what most of us routinely do it but there is something called closed suction also i'll come to that in a minute and uh, uh, if you want to suction uh, another important thing which i found it practically useful is the suctioning the laryngopharynx area if you want to adjust the position suppose the endotracheal position has been not fixed properly it is too in or too out and you want to change the position so please suction around the endotracheal tube before that means a deep suction into the laryngopharyngeal area and then you manipulate uh, the endotracheal tube the other thing is when you want to change reintubate for some purpose either tube block or some other reason again do a good suction and then reintubate because uh, when you are if, because there is high risk of aspiration when you are trying to manipulate the endotracheal tube or when you want to reintubate so for that reason to decrease the aspiration of those contents it's important that uh, you do this a word about closed suction so this is a, what is what it looks like a closed suction catheter so this is the catheter is inside this uh, protected sleeve so it remains sterile and uh, this is a port where it is connected to the suction as well as to the ventilator so ventilation continues that is the main advantage here so there is no disturbance of map the main important thing in closed suction is you don't disturb the map you don't disturb the fio2 at all so ventilation is being continued so especially this is very important in a baby who is on a high frequency ventilation when you are on a very high map and you frequently disconnect it uh, and then do a suction the pressure is dropping from map of say 14 15 to 0 so the alveolar de recruitment happens instantly so again when you reconnect the ventilator there is again it takes significant amount of time for the baby to improve back to his previous pre suction state so for that reason closed suction uh, is physical i mean theoretically if you look at closed suction is a better option in a baby especially who is on a high ventilator and the thing is you don't need to change the suction catheter every time so this is a single use catheter can be used for a, this literature says that up to 3 days it can be used so that is another advantage of this but otherwise this is the commonest thing there are problems with the open suction frequent disconnections or frequent changes in the map happen the more risk of destabilization there is risk of contamination so there are problems with open suction but that is what we have been using till now but if a baby is not on very high map setting cs close section open section is quite uh, useful but if you if it is possible again close section can be used 
extubation as i said so earlier if you look at uh, again coming back to the risk factors reintubation is an important risk factor i said earlier so when you are extubating so please ensure you follow the checklist again which has been shown in the supportive care a live demonstration so follow that checklist once everything is okay then only extubate don't try to extubate uh, without the baby is not fulfilling the, fulfilling the checklist but at the same time doesn't mean that you continue ventilation for a longer duration because the moment you tube him your extubation plan has to be ready because longer the duration of ventilation again you increase the risk of vap at the same time if the extubation fails again it increases the risk of vap so both ways it is dangerous you cannot continue ventilation for a longer time at the same time you cannot reintubate again and again so be very careful follow the extubation checklist so that helps you in uh, decreasing the risk of vap significantly enteral feeds as i said earlier yes these are very wonderful so you can use mother's own milk the most important thing so it is helpful in reducing the incidence of vap but the other thing is oral colostrum can we apply oral colostrum into the buccal mucosa again to increase uh, the colonization aspects and to increase the uh, because colostrum is found to be rich in several growth factors secretory iga secretory igm which is uh, not usually found but it is found in the colostrum so siga sigm and igg is very rich in colostrum so that helps in increasing the so that these things will decrease the adherence of pathogenic organisms on to the cell so thereby preventing the translocation of bacteria so uh, this uh, has been utilized and uh, people have tried even chlorhexidine also especially in pediatrics and adults they can apply a chlorhexidine but it is not recommended in neonates because there is a risk of absorption of chlorhexidine and we don't know the cns effects of that so if you look at the oral colostrum and uh, vap there is a meta analysis which has shown that uh, it does decrease the incidence of uh, vap by almost 7 60% reduction in the vap is seen if you look at it here but mind you these are very small studies you can look at the event rates they are very small so you can have to take and there is a significant heterogeneity is there so you have to take it with uh, caution but it is safe rather you can try oral colostrum in preventing the vap uh, there are certain things which you have to avoid like routine use of ranitidin h2 blockers or proton pump inhibitors they have been shown to increase the risk of nec and vap because you are altering the colonization if you decrease the gastric acidity so for that reason you should not supposed to increase uh, you should don't avoid don't use an atrin uh, uh, regularly so these are some of the aspects uh, i think i am running out of time so i'll just brush through the uh, infection control uh, so the microbes uh, they enter the environment from outside to nico through several routes it could be through air water personnel through us because various things we are wearing and the baby itself may be carrying the bug into the nicu so the environment has to be so the infection control starts from the nico design itself so it should uh, that when you are designing you should ensure that the the environment is proper it does not increase the risk of uh, infection so, so we should take care of the air so air has to be uh, filtered through hepa filters number of air exchanges almost 12 air exchanges has to happen per hour inside the nicu you can have a positive pressure usually we have a positive pressure in the nicu that means uh, in the nicu has, so that the outside air doesn't enter into the nicu but in certain situations you have a negative pressure so that the septic uh, the in infected air doesn't enter the other areas so this is again very important water has to be sterile the one which is used for hand washing not at least it has to be uh, clean water it has to be ro and uv filtered for hand washing as well as it should be almost sterile for preparing the formulas housekeeping routines are very important you should have a policy this is uh, from the uh, aims uh, disinfection module so you can use these things these are available freely on the internet you can look at them so stick it into the in your nicus and then yeah i, I mean uh, ensure that your housekeeping staff are doing it properly so you have to train them again and again and always you should monitor them whether they are doing it properly or not so this has to be repeatedly they have to do it so uh, all the housekeeping routines have to be done uh, very meticulously the most important us the healthcare professionals we there is again a lot of uh, uh we are again poor in hand washing the multiple studies have shown that uh, the health personnel do not do a proper hand hygiene techniques 
So again, just to reiterate, you all know it theoretically, but again, you fail to do it. So that is again a major source of infection. So we have to use these five moments of hand hygiene. Two is before and three is after. So all these things you have to follow properly. There are two situations where you have to hand wash. That means you have to go to the sink, use soap and water. To one. So when we have to do it, when your hands are visibly dirty or soiled with either blood or body fluids or something, or after coming from, a, after visiting a washroom. So in all these situations, you have to do a proper hand wash. In other situation, and the other situation is, which is not usually encountered in the newborn, that is, if a baby or a person is infected with spore-bearing organisms like uh, Clostridium difficile, hand wash is a preferred means. In all other situations, hand drop is enough, but you have to use it properly. You should take adequate, uh, don't be stingy in taking, in using the hand rub. So you have to take adequately. So at least three to five ml has to be taken and follow all the five steps of uh, hand rub and then allow it to dry and then do it. And never do both. So don't be too aggressive. Don't wash your hands and then immediately put your alcohol. So because both are going to neutralize each other because soap is an alkali, this is an alcohol. So both will nullify each other and you end up a hand which is uh, not great so that is why avoid doing both uh, another important strategy is surveillance very important to look at the infection control how you are doing otherwise you think that you don't have infections but if you do a proper surveillance a proper audit in the unit you will find you do have infections then you will think of strategies to reduce the then you can do a quality initiative to reduce your in, uh, infections Okay, so one of the quality surveillance uh, in a, within the unit is WAP surveillance you can use. So number of WAP episodes by number of ventilate days into 1000. So this you can use to look at the uh, thing. Okay. So in conclusion, sorry, I have to run through the infection control, but uh, that is how it is because of time constraints. So WAP, we all know that it increases morbidity. It is possible and doable. We should have a good strategy. Infection control is better strategy. We, as we know that prevention is always better than cure. Uh, thank you. Over to Dr. Tejo. Yeah. Thank you, Sriram. Uh, I think we are 12 minutes late. There are a few questions. I think you can take it on the chat box, Sriram. Yeah. Okay. There are mainly regarding the suction catheter and other things. I think you can go through them once and then you can take it up uh, so that I can start up the next lecture. Okay. Can you stop slide share? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Mangalbarthi sir, can you open your video? Dr. Mangla sir, hello? Hello, Mangla sir. Oh, yeah, Tejo, do you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just about to. Yeah. Okay. We can hear you. Searching. Just a second. Yeah, I made you co-host already. So. Let me see. Yeah, sure. Okay.